Hello and welcome to HIV RNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. So that really sets the scene, doesn't it? That lab-focused perspective. Our mission today is basically to pull out the key advancements and what they mean for you in practice. Exactly. And despite, I mean, decades of really, really tough scientific challenges, 2025 has genuinely shown some remarkable momentum. Uh, things are moving. And it's mostly being driven by things like innovative trial designs, obviously the potential of mRNA tech, uh, finding new antibody targets, and also the, the growing power of AI. By the end of this, you'll hopefully have a really clear idea of what these breakthroughs could mean for HIV testing itself. Things like identifying new immune markers, uh, developing next-gen antibody assays, all that sort of thing. New diagnostic possibilities, really. Yeah, I'm really keen to unpack how this, like, fundamental science is actually hitting the bench, you know, <laughs> making a difference in labs like yours. So, okay, let's get into it. So the first big area, uh, it's something called a heterologous boosting mRNA strategy. Sounds complex, but essentially it means using two different but related mRNA vaccines, a prime, then a boost. It's like teaching the immune system in layers, right? And what's really catching attention are two phase one trials. Uh, IAVI and Scripps led these, showing some promising early results with this two-step method. Right. The innovation is really in the, um, the effectiveness of this two-step approach. These trials, they ran in North America and Africa, and they showed it didn't just kickstart an immune response. Mm. It actually seemed to kind of advance it, push the immune system towards making more mature, more effective antibodies. And that potentially really speeds up the development timeline compared to, you know, older vaccine methods. Okay, so for labs, diagnostic labs, that sounds like it changes the game for actually monitoring how well a vaccine is working. When we think about these maybe earlier but more advanced antibody signals, what are the big new opportunities or maybe challenges this creates for the tests we use now? That's Yeah, that's a key question. It means labs aren't just looking for a simple yes or no on antibodies anymore. We need to develop assays that can pick up these um, intermediate, frankly, neutralizing antibody markers, the BNABs. So labs could maybe track the actual maturation of the immune response almost in real time. Imagine seeing how that response builds, you know, from the first signals to a more protective state that definitely needs more sophisticated functional tests and uh, being able to spot maybe new patterns of seroconversion. That depth of insight. Yeah, that's profound. OK, moving to the second breakthrough, germline targeting vaccines. This is a really powerful idea. The vaccine basically primes specific uh, naive B cells, the really early immune cells, and then sort of guides them to mature and make those those BNABs everyone's after. And it's not just theory. Moderna's work using mRNA nanoparticles has actually shown this strategy working in people, uh, both in the U.S. and in African participants. So it offers a, well, a much more precise way to sort of direct how the immune system evolves towards making these really potent antibodies. Right. So from the lab side, this feels like a new frontier in immune monitoring. What kind of specific new assays or, I don't know, tracking tools would labs need to really use this ability to guide B cell maturation? Uh huh. This breakthrough points towards developing, well, completely new assays for early B cell activation signals. We need ways to track those specific germline B cells as they change, as they differentiate, and probably advanced antibody sequencing methods to really analyze their maturation path. Think about detecting each step in that B cell development pipeline with new tests. That kind of capability could be huge for, say, personalized vaccine strategies, maybe even speed up drug development by showing effective immune pathways way earlier. OK, pivotal stuff. Yeah. Then there's the discovery of a powerful new antibody target on the HIV spike protein. This was huge, right? It came from a Scripps and Karolinska study, I think, in primates, where a vaccine series got BNABs to block something like 70 percent of diverse HIV strains. Yes, and that's incredibly significant because it wasn't just about a new vaccine design. It was finding a new binding site, one we didn't really know about before, on the HIV spike that's highly effective. And that knowledge, that discovery, directly fed back into refining the vaccine design itself, making a better mimic of the spike. It just opens up completely new ways to think about making vaccines more targeted and hopefully more effective. And the lab implications there seem pretty direct, too. How does finding a new target like that change how labs design and use functional assays, you know, the, the ones trying to measure vaccine effectiveness or even detect infection. Well, it drives the development of more sophisticated functional neutralization assays mm. and particularly pseudovirus assays. Remember, those are the safe engineered viruses labs use. They mimic HIV but can infect, so you can measure how well antibodies block the real thing. These assays would now be specifically designed to assess blocking at this newly found epitope, that specific spot on the spike where the good antibodies bind. 
it really pushes what our diagnostic tools can do in terms of precisely identifying vaccine-induced protection. Okay, fourth breakthrough area, the role of AI in vaccine design. It feels like AI is everywhere now, and HIV research is no exception. At IAS 2025, apparently there were some pretty incredible examples shown. AI helping design immunogens, the bits that trigger the immune response simulating trials, even making data analysis more equitable. Oh, absolutely. AI is fundamentally changing the R&D workflow. It can shorten development cycles, I mean, dramatically. Yeah. Everything from picking the best immunogen candidates right through to planning human trials. It allows for predictive modeling of antibody responses. Um, AI can help with flow cytometry, gating that cell sorting analysis, and even speeds up developing virtual assays. Imagine a lab using AI-designed peptides for super-fast antibody screening, testing you know, hundreds of thousands of potential interactions in the time it used to take for maybe a few dozen. It's a massive speed up. That kind of acceleration, though, raises a big practical question for labs. How do you actually integrate these complex AI tools into the existing lab setup to really get the most out of them and, you know, speed things up like that? Yeah, that's the challenge, isn't it? It definitely means investment. New computers, probably uh, training for the staff and likely a shift in just how data is managed and crunched. But the potential payoff and efficiency is, well, it's immense. Right. Okay, finally, our fifth point isn't a pure science breakthrough, but it's just as critical navigating the funding and policy landscape because you can have amazing science. But the reality for labs, as you know, is that funding cuts like the ones hitting NIH and USAID studies can just stop promising work cold. Researchers' equipment suddenly idle. It's not just politics. It's a real operational problem day to day. Precisely. And political headwinds may be stemming from, say, reports about mRNA, vaccine side effects, things like highs, even if rare. Yeah. That can translate directly into regulatory hurdles for labs. Suddenly you might face stricter reporting rules, longer waits for trial approvals, maybe even trouble recruiting people for ongoing studies. It directly impacts those timelines AI is trying to shrink. It can seriously delay getting a potential vaccine out there. But despite all that, the resilience of the scientific community is pretty remarkable, isn't it? New trial designs are still moving forward. People are exploring non-mRNA strategies too. Global collaborations are continuing. It really just highlights how vital it is to keep advocating for study funding and really engaging with those lab networks like the 4,500 plus across the U.S. that are doing this crucial work. Okay, so let's just quickly pull those threads together. We've covered quite a bit. These heterologous mRNA boosting strategies, refining the immune response, then the germline targeting vaccines, trying to guide immunity right from the start. That discovery of a powerful new antibody target on the HIV spike, huge potential there. Then AI, just transforming the speed and approach of vaccine design. And finally, acknowledging those real-world hurdles, the funding and policy challenges, and the resilience needed to push through them. Yeah, and if you connect all those dots, it becomes really clear how these breakthroughs feed directly into making lab testing better, smarter, faster. We're talking more sophisticated antibody assays to track immune development, um, more precise immune tracking overall, designing highly specific diagnostic tools. It all brings us closer step-by-step step to both a working vaccine and much better diagnostics along the way. Yeah. These aren't just abstract ideas. They have real, tangible implications for how you, in those thousands of testing labs, understand, detect, and maybe one day help prevent HIV. So thinking about all these incredible steps forward, but also those persistent challenges like funding, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? What does it mean for us, for everyone listening, to stay informed, stay engaged as these frontiers keep expanding, especially with something as vital as public health and how we diagnose disease? It really does raise that important question. In a world where science can move so fast, but also hit major roadblocks, how do we best support these discoveries? How do we leverage them to actually help the most people and, crucially, make sure that the vital work happening in labs like yours can keep going without disruption?